Thank you. My name is uh, Giovanni Corbeto. I am the Safety, Health and Environment Manager for the NSF Noir Lab Chile and the Rubin Observatory Project also uh, in Chile. Um, my background is on, um, 10 years, over 10 years uh, dedicated to the safety profession. I'm a safety engineer and I'm um, working uh, mainly on my background on mining industry, uh, both in Chile and in Iceland, in drilling service. And uh, for the last eight years, working with the, uh, the Neuer Lab Aura organization in Chile uh, at the area of the safety, health, and environment. So with me is uh, Riva Golden from UCAR. She will present herself. I'm Riva Golden. I'm from UCAR. I uh, am a health and safety specialist as well as an industrial hygienist. Um, I do a lot with our training and outreach programs as well as all of our OSHA compliance as well as radiation safety. Been with the group for nine years and we are pretty excited to talk to you all about leadership and safety today. Okay, so uh, we put some objectives and some goals for this SANA session today. Uh, when we uh, uh, meet together uh, with Riva and Richard or I and mean, the rest of the safety folks for the for these sessions, um, we we provide and we propose to an, uh, uh, have an session where we can uh, talk about the how the leadership could be um, could be uh, provide a good. Um, performance on successful safety performance. The, the leadership on a play an important and a key on a role and in, in, during the, at the, at the safety at the organization. So taking care of the safe work environment. We, we want to provide knowledge and uh, uh, skills uh, about to how to effectively uh, lead and manage safety in the workplace. Um, also, we will talk about some tips, some uh, very uh, useful ideas, how they the, the managers and the, and the directors could implementing safety measures and fostering a safety culture as well. So um, saying that, we will start with the, this dynamic. The idea is to provide an, a tips and we will talk about some uh, samples that we can, uh, that we think are useful for leadership. And uh, by then we will put some uh, um, real, real life <laughs> or maybe and, uh, very close to the, to the reality and uh, situations. Uh, regarding leadership and safety. So that means there's going to be a quiz at the end. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so be prepared. Okay. So um, we we want to start with the first tips. And uh, as I mentioned during the uh, the intersection uh, between safety and DEI uh, session, I talk a little bit about the how important is the commitment from the top. Um, that's very uh, uh, adequate word say commitment. Um, for your information in Spanish, commitment uh, is, an, uh, an, uh, is, an, is a word that is very hard to translate because commitment uh, is equal to an, uh, something that you uh, uh, have an, a compromise, but from your soul. It's not because somebody uh, obliged to you or forced to you. So commitment, uh, it is something that is uh, very uh, decided by yourself but in, in, uh, according to a uh, specific uh, regulation or framework. So when we talk about commitment from the top with safety, we are talking about risk prevention must be a priority from senior management. So starting from the very top of the organization down to the, to the organization's level should be uh, on a very, very priority commitment. The leaders should be demonstrate a clear and visible commitment to the workplace safety. So it's not enough to write on the policy, it's not enough to say it, or it's not enough to say at uh, the, uh, the poster that you have at the, at the entrance of the facilities. It's more than that. Uh, we, uh, the, the commitment from the top start from the very, very uh, actions that the, the leadership of the organization take uh, in regards of safety. So what this might look like is uh, having an EHS or safety person at a director level where there can be direct lines of communication from leadership. Uh, in addition, just having leadership saying, yeah, we want to have a safe work environment and we want to have staff um, to provide these services and, and collaborate with people to ensure that there is a safe workplace. Um, with this, it also should enable autonomy with, you know, the safety department being able to you know, bring up safety initiatives without being like, hey, do I have to ask permission? And, you know, if something is unsafe, 
uh, there should be that ability to bring that up and have discussions and, and resolutions on it. Um, and then also just having a, a good reporting structure where, you know, whether you are at the top or, um, you know, line level worker, um, being able to report a safety concern without, you know, fear of retaliation or saying, well, you know, we have this project and it's due tomorrow and we can't value that safety comment. Um, it, it should be, you know, something that is, you know, conversation where it could be collaborative as well as, you know, ensuring that we're getting good resolutions for everyone. Uh, something maybe, I don't know if it's important, but the counter is not, uh, it's not on. So we, we still have 50 minutes. We will be here forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now it's working. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um. Yeah, so, um, you know, to tag on to the having, you know, clear reporting structure as well as, um, you know, reducing conflict of interest, this is what goes along with safety culture. So this is fostering an organizational culture where values promote uh, safety at all times. So this could be engaging employees in risk identification, you know, walking the areas regularly, getting a good understanding of um, what people are doing. And this is, you know, at all levels, you know, the top of the organization should have some level of understanding of what um, hazards people may be interfacing with and then what we're doing to ensure, you know, hey, here's here's our safe practice. And this might be why, you know, when we have these deadlines up top, um, we can't just roll with that. We need a little bit more time or we need more resources. So having a good understanding of, you know, just what's going on and, and building that culture of, you know, top down and bottom up um, is really good for having safety participation. So, um, and it's also just going through and saying like, hey, I'm here today. Like, let's talk about what your challenges are. Let's talk about where we can improve things. Um, you know, giving staff the opportunity to identify hazards and say like, can we fix this? Um, and then also that comes with regular safety training as well as recognizing and rewarding safe behaviors. So, um, a few other times we've mentioned, you know, oh, this isn't to looking to place blame. This is, you know, looking for improvement. And so like, you know, even just a culture of having a rewards program of like, hey, you reported this hazard. Thank you so much for doing that. Like, great job. <laughs> That, that's several uh, aspects that we should consider it, or the, the management or the leadership should consider it in safety culture. Uh, but means for reporting safety is uh, very important. Uh, Danny mentioned during his uh, presentation, report, report, report. As much as we get uh, reports, we must, we will be more, uh, that will be more easy for us, the safety team, the safety uh, professionals, to understand what is going on and provide to the leadership a best, the best strategy to uh, to uh, uh, confront that, to uh, achieve, to address the potential uh, um, hazard that they are, are around the organization. So, how we create that between a safety culture? Well, educating people educating the employees and how to uh, proceed when something happened. When an uh, incident near miss or accident happened, it's very important that the, the information and the data uh, has been well uh, processed and get in the right channels of communication. Uh, in that sense, uh, uh, the responsibility or the tips for the leadership in this case is to provide the means for a strong safety culture have an, uh, an, a show and something will be done, apply the stop of board authority. Uh, do not base uh, your programs in a, we get to zero because it's, uh, mm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Unachievable sometimes. Mm -hmm. Rather than based on people doing the right thing. Recognition board and for example, an annual safety award program is that something that's very recommendable to want to create and a safety culture and achieve that. Okay, here is another one that's kind of related to the to the uh, before and the tips, but uh, we we want to put on separate to highlight the importance is the risk assessment. So a conduct periodic risk assessment in all area of the organization to identify potential hazard and take preventive measure to mitigate them. This sounds like an, uh, if, every, if I ask everybody here, we'll say, oh, well, my, my safety manager do that every time. My safety officer do that all the time. 
But no, we are talking here, you, you, the manager, you, the director, going with the safety officer and performs a risk assessment at least once a year or twice a year. That will be very important for you to understand. And that will be very important for the safety culture because people will see you do that. People will see that the director, the highest management of the company, of the organization, is walking. Sorry, maybe it was me. Uh, the, 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 the highest uh, uh, level of the organization is walking with the safety officer doing an risk assessment. Beside any other activities, is on focus on that. Um, Riva, you have? Yeah, so this just means, you know, as a leader, making sure that, again, you understand um, what's actually going on in, in your labs and your workspaces and understanding the work that and tasks that people are doing. So um, we have a facility. It's, you know, um, it's our supercomputing facility. And it's like their pride is like, hey, like we are world class. Like we we welcome inspectors to come in. We we can't wait for, um, you know, OSHA to do a walkthrough here. You know, we welcome that because we are so proud of um, our mission and what we're doing that, you know, if, if there's anything that actually comes up, it's just going to be more room for us to improve. So like as leaders, that's a really good uh, mindset to have of just like, do I know what's going on in my space and am I, am I proud of it? And are we doing our due diligence to ensure that um, if someone were to come through or an injury were to happen or even just a small, um, you know, I guess a, a small level incident were to happen, you would know how to respond to that and at least know hey, I need to contact these people, or hey, we need to stop work, we need to start having an investigation. So um, again, it's just having an awareness and knowing that um, if we are doing things unsafely, like maybe that's t a point to have a conversation. Here is another one that um, have a uh, very good uh, <laughs> yeah. importance. Uh, the clear procedures and policies. So establish a clear safety and occupational health procedures and policies and ensure that all employees are training to understand and follow those policies. And here is the tricky one of these tips. You can create once, but it's not enough. You as a leadership must be do it every year on the reviews and analysis and an evaluation of the, uh, the uh, successful of your policies and procedures. That's, an, uh, that's something that you, you will must have the support of the safety team and also the operational teams and managers in order to see how is the impact of the procedures and policies uh, on the workplace. Uh, it is very important that uh, you understand as a leadership that is not once task, is a uh, forever task. So as much as you have in the company right now, you must be having a review process of your procedures and policies to, to see that they are according to what is going on. How you feed that, that with incident, accidents report, against report, 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 and uh, make sure to have an, a robust and consistent EHA's documentation structure because should be always according to the reality. That's an, a many an, uh, at the market safety market, as many a management system that you can buy. And that will be, I don't know, $300, maybe more. And that will be very easy to buy one of them and say to the people, okay, here is the safety policy and the safety procedures, and that's it. But maybe it will be not any reality with the what happened in your organization. And uh, consequently, it will be an, uh, an a fiasco. That was, you know, nothing, nothing over there. You will not get nothing for, from that policy and procedures. Yeah, so as a leader, what this might look like is I'm just going to be, I, th I think in real application, most of the time when it comes to safety policies and procedures, um, a lot of times you are having your EHS or safety representatives writing these procedures. But as a leader, it may be um, just as like as little as having an awareness that these procedures are there and maybe having an awareness of what they are. When it comes down to maybe more like line level supervisors, it may be having an awareness of what processes and tasks are we doing? And then going through and actually write, you know, starting to write procedures around those and not just necessarily mm. safety oriented or safety specifically, but it is, you know, what's the task we're doing? Who's doing it? How many people are doing it? Where might there be places where we could have challenges or risks? Where can people get hurt? How do we do this? And as you're documenting all of this, this is a way that you're gonna 
enhance safety as well as, you know, it, it can help with quality and productivity as well. So um, that's what it would look like at a leadership level of, you know, having an awareness that policies and procedures are there as well as maybe going around with teams and saying, hey, do we have these? <laughs> are they there? Mm -hmm. Are they accurate? And are they sufficient? Here's another one that um, uh, is uh, one of the tips uh, important for the leadership is effective communication. Um, the clearly and regularly communication safety procedures identify risk and preventive measure to all employees. Uh, as, uh, many times that when, when we have an, uh, platforms to provide and communicate or new procedures or standards, that they are for real not very useful or is not very popular between the, the team. And uh, sometimes uh, the, the other means, such as a uh, board or an, a talk by talk, is the way that people communicate the, the, the new regulations or the, or the communication about safety. So be sure that you have an, uh, uh, not one, but several means uh, or, or channels to communicate safety. Uh, and according to, the, to that, uh, be sure also that the, when you communicate, that message is coming, is getting to the people, is getting to your employees. How is that? Surveys and many other means that can help you to understand and feed, have a feedback about if people is getting the message that you are trying to communicate. So not one, several of them, and, and also uh, have an, a, a constantly uh, review and checking if the means that you choose as a communication for safety are impacting or are Having a, having a successful and a, a reception by the employees. So at the leadership level, what this can look like is, you know, <laughs> actually making sure, like if you are a top up leader, you may actually be the one who has to communicate a safety message on behalf of other staff. You may, you may be a big initiatives coming through and you may need to be the one that's saying, you know what? lab inspections are coming up and this is very important and we need to make sure that we are doing our best to make sure that we are following through with this and you know getting all of our data for improvement making sure we have a safe workplace mm -hmm. um in addition with that it's keeping our communication simple when, when it comes to safety you know i mean you could be like giovanni and me and have a bunch of experience and degrees but safety really is like something anyone can do it's that gut feeling am i gonna get hurt is this dangerous you know so it's kind of just saying like you know, I can do that and anyone can do that. So making sure that we're not getting really deep into that technical language and just keeping it simple of, hey, what's going to speak to people in languages and in, in terminology and, and methods that they can understand. As we go into things with, um, you know, even just with remote and collaborative work environments, it's making sure that you know, if we are putting out communication that we are giving several means for it. So like, you know, if your staff um, are deployed frequently for, let's just say, Arctic research, I mean, making sure that the training is in both, you know, virtual formats, maybe if we're hosting a lot of visitors, making sure that it is in different languages or, you know, if we need um, closed captioning or translation, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that those services are available. Yeah, that, that, that's a very good uh, uh, comment about the and we are here touching a little bit about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, be sure that the, where you are, in our case in Chile, we have an, a multicultural an, uh, environment of employees. We have people from all around the world. So every time that we communicate something rega regarding safety, we must be sure that we are made it in the, in the, in the way that everybody will understand that regarding language, closed captions, and many other means. So, it is very, very important, uh, uh, both for the effective of the communication and the uh, DEI aspect of the safety that should be. Uh, so another thing is just making sure that we have appropriate equipment tools for successful safety. So that is making sure that um, mm -hmm. we're providing employees with appropriate personal protective equipment, ensuring that all of that is in good working condition. Um, as a leader, this doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you need to go out and inspect every every um, like non-conductive electrical glove or the arc gear. But that means that you may need to make sure that we're allocating budget and time for, you know, to purchase that, 
equipment as well as making sure that people are able to access it um, when they need it. Um, and it also just makes sure that we're, we're making sure we have good tools and equipment in the workplace. So, you know, that one extension cord that we've been using for 40 years that's been run over a number of times by all of the vehicles that's starting to show exposed wiring, like making sure that we are getting good equipment and having, you know, the right tools for the tasks. Even it's not the first layer of the hierarchy of the risk or hazard control, PPE is very important for the organization, especially for the employees. So for some reason, the employees, the workers, the first thing that they understand and know about safety is the PPE that the company provides to them. And it's very reflected to the consequence and the, and, the, and the comments that they do it to the management. Say, how is the company regarding safety? The first answer will say will be, well, they, they provide us with the properly PPE. So why is this important? Even as I say before, it's not the first layer in the hierarchy of the control of risk. PPE is very important for how people perceive, have the perception of the performance of the management in safety. So if you are a manager and you have interest in the PPE that your employees are using or wearing, that will be on a reflection to them that you are with them in safety. So you can create a very good and a feedback of a, and a safety environment, safety culture between the, the use of the PP. So here we say that as a leader requests a regular report to the EHS team, to the safety officer, say, okay, show me what is the PPE that the people is wearing and why is that? Have some interest in that. Um, the, beside the B, as we say here, is, the, is legally, is a regulatory and mandatory framework to provide PPE to the employees. Beyond that, you can use it as a, as a manager, uh, the PPE uh, aspect to uh, create a safety culture and a kind of an abound and relationship with your employees and workers. I would say with personal protective equipment, it also goes down to actually walking the walk with this. So if you are going into an area where personal protective equipment is required as a leader, you should be like, hey, I see that there's some signage. What's appropriate for me to wear? Um, when it comes to line level leadership and management, um, it's also I'm going to use electrical safety for an, an example. You know, the 40 uh, calorie B suits, you know, um, maybe you see that a, a staff member is working on a project with, you know, live electrical and you're like, I know that they should be in their 40 cal suit right now. It may be up to you to have that conversation of like, hey, I noticed that you're not wearing, you know, your 40 cal suit. Why is that? And you may hear a whole lot of things of like, oh, well, you know, it just gets really hot or, you know, I, I don't actually I'm not able to you know, use my tools appropriately. I, I lose dexterity with it. And so it may be you know, your job to either say, well, it's important to wear this equipment and here's why, or it may be, you know, a conversation you need to elevate up to a higher level saying, you know, it's really hot when they're wearing these 40 cal suits. Mm. Is there a better way to get ventilation? Is there a way that we can get suits that have fans in them? You know, make ways or try to find ways so that, you know, whatever our safety protocols are when it pertains to personal protective equipment that we can be successful with you know, making staff feel like, yes, it's important to wear them and making sure that they're comfortable yeah. with it. And understand why. That's yeah. very important <laughs> because, yeah, when, when you as a manager provide answers and um, impact in the people, impact in the employees, they, they see and a manager that have commitment, again, commitment with the, with safety through the, the understand and the knowledge of why we are required in a, in a specific or certain PPE for different areas we were mentioned. Oh, here's an important one. Well, training programs are a great way to, um, you know, get successful safety. And so um, this is, you know, making sure that um, we are having training programs. So this is, again, for maybe on the job training at specific staff levels. And this can also be, you know, general facility safety, general site safety, general site orientations. This could also include. Um, supervisor specific safety orientations where you're having, you know, training for leadership level saying, you know, as a leader, here's what your roles and responsibilities are as, as a supervisor and lead. And here's all the resources that you have and here's better ways to engage staff. So um, it's just making sure that we are, um, you know, not only having mandatory programs for the line level staff, but as leaders, you know, we're participating in that program and we know what staff are supposed to be trained on so that we can help you know, that awareness and accountability. Very important, stay involved. 
Every time you hear about a new task in your organization, speak up to ask if the training to, for this task is up to date. That's very important. Uh, I know companies that uh, have an, a training program for supervisor to be an, uh, trainers. So the, the, the train, safety trainings are provided on not technical level, but a uh, um, very uh, general level by supervisor. So it's very, it's very good when you see an, a supervisor or manager be a trainer for their own employees talking about safety. That creates, uh, again, a uh, commitment and uh, people start to trust in, uh, in the safety program through that. C is not only the safety officer or the safety professional who have the talking or lead the, the trainings, is uh, also another way to commit and create safety culture. Leadership could participate. Um, the, the, the other an aspect is should be an, uh, always be sure that the budget is there for safety training and, uh, and understand why it's necessary. Why is, uh, why is the reason because we are requesting through the program uh, a specific trainings and the importance, how will be impact in my production, in my operation, if somebody in my team doesn't have the properly training and how will be impacted if something happened. So that kind of a knowledge uh, and be involved in the training program is very, very useful and is very uh, uh, impact a lot in the program, uh, in the successful of the safety performance at all. <laughs> so encouraging participation. So, um, you know, this is how do we make safety less of like, a, you know, we're here to, you know, be mean and tell you what you can't do and, you know, punish you for doing something wrong. This is um, that isn't really the foundations for a successful safety program. That isn't really the foundations for making people feel comfortable and participating in it. So um, you do want to try to have some optimism about it. It's not. It's not something that's a burden, it's something that can save your life. And so it's, you know, getting staff engagement and involvement. And so this can be with, you know, not only risk identification and solution seeking, but this is, you know, just getting active participation in our programs and um, making sure that it is a value um, for staff and that we are, you know, we're taking the suggestions in a positive manner. So like anytime our team gets a, you know, safety concern, we're always saying, thank you for bringing that up. And here's the steps I'm going to take on resolving that. And, you know, we look forward to um, conversations in the future about this. So it's not like, you know, just saying, oh, well, you're fired for <laughs> telling me about this. Like, and it could be something if someone was saying like, you know, I was, I was driving to a field site and I almost fell asleep at the wheel. You know, that isn't something we're gonna say, well, you're a bad driver and we're gonna take away your driving privileges. That is, you know, looking more at your programs and saying, what can we actually do to um, prevent this for other folks? Yeah. Well, Danny say uh, during his session, he say, as many reports of near miss and incident I have over my desk, I'm more happy. I don't know if <laughs> that was like that, but he say something like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's true. We we want feedback. The, the, the management should have, be happy to have an, a very and a strong feedback of report. Again, report, 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 and not only incident and accident, also and as something ideas, uh, opportunities to improvement on safety. Uh, provide and be open to provide emails, um, social networking, uh, many others, verbally, uh, QR codes, wherever is necessary to people be free and feel an uncomfortable communicating safety issues, safety feedback, safety problems, because that will feed your safety program in order to be better. Um, when you show as a manager, as a director, that you are open and you have a space and budget to create those instances, that will be an, uh, an, a reflection in your team. Your employees will see, oh my God, you know what? The other day, I have an, uh, a situation in my world related to safety. Rather than fire me, <laughs> they ask me for more information and they create something to, to, to uh, improve that, uh, that uh, or provide me a solution to the, to the problem. So, well, of course, it's a limit, some limits. We will not accept some things, but however, it's, uh, it's important to have uh, feedback. It's important to, uh, in that uh, ideas, be, uh, be uh, be reality. So just take some, some of the paper 
And uh, sometimes I, I remember I saw in uh, the north of Chile and a company that provide a solution for safety and put the name of the owner of the idea. So that was very remarkable to see. This uh, new on a PPE uh, dispenser was an, a Danny Sellers idea. And Danny said, oh my God, Danny Sellers, who's Danny Sellers? Well, it's one of the worker. And that was something, you know, encouraged people to participate, to see the name. Sometimes they put awards, say, okay, that the best idea on safety this month will, will have something, you know, a nice hat, a nice cap, t-shirt, I don't know, things like that will help. I will just add with participation, you know, having that. Um, I know that a lot of folks these days enjoy a hybrid environment, um, but you know, for, at that leadership level, it really is important to make sure that you're going through these spaces and having conversations. Um, just building those relationships is really good to make sure, you know, just people feel comfortable talking with you. And that's a lot of times it's just going to come up organically like, hey, how are you doing? How was your weekend? And then, you know, oh, I noticed this the other day. Oh, cool. Tell me more about it. <laughs> and then like, you know, with that, you know, sometimes it is important to make sure we're being honest with people. So sometimes, you know, we say like report, report, report. But what does that look like in practice? You know, sometimes there may be reasons why we can't actually have like the desired outcome of like, I want this brand new piece of, you know, lifting equipment that's going to fix all of my problems. Like sometimes that's just not feasible. So it's one of those like having, making sure that you are being honest and having these open conversations of like, you know, we do recognize this is an issue. Um, here's the steps we're gonna take now here's why we can't do these other steps and really making it a collaborative conversation of like, you know, I'm on your side. We're not happy about some of this stuff either. Are we okay to like come up with a reasonable, acceptable level of risk with maybe these additional outcomes, but maybe not the full goal that we wanted. So sometimes you just have to, you know, sometimes it is a compromise and just being open with that is gonna be a lot better for, again, increasing that uh, culture as well as participation. Okay, here is the, 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 the bad, not the bad one, but the one that uh, Danny uh, explained a, a lot and in deep about the incident analysis and uh, accidents investigation. But the conduct of uh, incident analysis after any safety related accident or incident uh, to identify underlying causes and take corrective action to prevent similar incident in the future. So as a manager, uh, as a leadership, uh, be sure that the, whenever something happens, whenever something gets to your desk, whenever something's been report, have the properly process to be evaluated, assessed, and uh, the properly analysis in order to see what is going on and why, why this happened. Um, the, the address that you can put to the investigation of the result uh, is something that is uh, will be uh, different according to the situation. Uh, I'm agree with Danny Seller in terms of uh, rather than looking for people responsible of incident, I'm looking for the causes and how our system failed in the in, in the incident or the accident and, and how we can improve the organization system in order to avoid that happen again in the future. I will just add that at the leadership level, it's important to make sure that we're taking ownership. If an incident does happen, we're not just going to sweep it under the rug. <laughs> you know, we do need to take action on it. And then it's also one of those, it's really important to just to make sure we're being transparent on it. This is what happened. Um, here's what we're doing to resolve it. Well, you know, just keeping people updated um, continuously. Yeah. And, 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 and something is very important is that whenever something happened, it's a process that have an uh, investigation, the the distribution and the transparency of the cause and the result of the investigation, the corrective or preventive measure apply it. But something that is very important, that is an, uh, uh, a very key uh, responsibility of the leadership is to follow up and tracking up how these measures and how these updates and improvement from the lesson learned of the incident has been implemented and how they are in use and how they are useful uh, for the workplace or for the, for the organization. All of the incident and accident are opportunities to improve. So that's super important. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so with safety programs, the Plan, Do, Check, Act model, I believe, is the ANSI standard, and OSHA also embraces it. But um, again, we, as we said, incidents are a good way to know where you can improve. Um, so we just want to make sure that we're conducting regular reviews and risk prevention uh, strategies. Uh, so, you know, whether that is um, at the field level, hey, what are we doing? How can we improve this? Um, or just, you know, making other adjustments to our safety program is a good way for success. Yeah. Well, not only the the the, the risk, the sorry, the accident and incidents analysis uh, needs an improved continuous improvement process. The entire management system for safety of the organization need to be under an improvement continuous or the continuous improvement. As a leadership, uh, uh, the, the, the leadership should be involved 100% in this process, asking uh, and request for an, uh, several uh, reviews during the year, maybe one or twice a year, make an, a deep review about safety and the management system. Be sure that the, the process, the procedures have been properly reviewed and uh, asking for reports to the managers, the supervisors and the safety officer about the successful improvement that has been implemented through the uh, management system for safety of the organization. Um, I think we have a, the, this is the, I think we're, I think it's time for the quiz. Yeah, so exactly. we've got some scenarios. <laughs> we're going to spend, I guess, a few minutes, uh, tapping your guys' brains for what y'all might do with the quiz. You want to yeah. move it to the quiz? So we're going to do a, what would you do in this situation if you were a leader and you valued safety? So the scenario is Nancy Newhire is so excited for her new job as an assistant project scientist working at the NASAFT facility. She went there on a tour of college and has been her dream job ever since. After her first week of meet, meet and greet, she joins the LAZ team um, and starts her training on construction of a really high intensity laser and x-ray system experiment. As she enters the lab, she is surprised to find that the laser system is fully energized while the research physicist and technician um, perform alignment activities. She also notices that the technician is without any personal protective equipment and he was viewing the laser focus through a chamber window. Nancy wants to take action immediately but can't find an emergency stop anywhere and ends up calling a stop work. She's concerned that the technician became exposed to non-direct laser light the research physicist is quite agitated and can't believe she would interrupt this important activity. The laser has to be deployed in two weeks. Shocked, Nancy doesn't know what to do and reaches out Dan, to Dan, the director. Dan said that she's overreacting and that they've been doing it this way for years. So as safety leaders, what do y'all think? All the leaders. Anyone? Yeah, I know it's pretty intimidating to give you guys a quiz. <laughs> I, I'm not sure exactly what I'd do. I'd be very concerned at this moment because if the person who's in the director position is downplaying safety and they're my manager, then I'm, I'm feeling very uncertain. I'm uncomfortable, right? I don't feel like this should be happening. And now do I jump the line to um, ask for help from further up chain or do I try to work this out within the team in terms of explaining why I'm concerned and how this situation could injure someone. So I, there's some personal relationships in here that have to be considered in terms of how you move forward. For sure. Yeah, thank you. Any other ideas? Yeah, that's a tricky one because in reality, this should not happen. Um, however, uh, you know, there is other avenues, um, uh, you know, if, if you were at the very top tier of your organization and, and something like this comes up, um, for me as a safety professional, of course, you know, your next step would be an outside organization that mm -hmm. governs the safety for that either the state, you know, or federal. Um, so. Yeah, I, I I hope that no director would ever just brush this off. Um, uh, so, I mean, at that point, like I said, uh, I would expect the director then to escalate this and bring the different teams and an investigation committee in to, you know, look at this 
unsafe conditions. So. Yeah. And then not proceed forward until there was an agreement of the mitigations. Yeah, exactly. Well, thanks for those comments on it. Um, well, by the way, NSA FT facility doesn't exist, and Dan doesn't exist as a director. So, by the way, it's just a clarification. Yeah. yeah so um, I think y'all, you know, I, I appreciate the two com comments on that, and and actually, you know, that really comes down to commitment from the top. You know, there's concerns like if this is what the director is doing, like we're gonna have some serious concerns. And if that's what your safety culture looks like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you wanna reconsider working at the NASAFT facility. <laughs> um, you know, the risk assessment at the leadership level, that could have been, you know, what did that laser lab look like? You know, we're dealing with high power lasers and x-rays. Did we make sure we did our risk assessment properly? You know, um, were there clear policies and procedures? Was the technician supposed to be looking in that viewing window? You know, is it part of the procedure to, before energizing the laser, you know, don all your safety equipment? You know, the effective communication, you know, when we're talking about laser control areas, you know, you shouldn't just be walking into a, a laser space without, you know, your your laser on signage. You know, there, there's typically some interlocks that go into place before, someone's even to walk a, walk into a lab when something is energized. So was there effective communication for, you know, the Sally, the scientist to walk into that space and not be exposed to hazards, you know, at that point, mm -hmm. um, you know, appropriate equipment and tools. Could there have been better enclosures for the laser? Was the viewing window adequate? You know, um, did, did Sally even get training on this lab before entering the space? Here's what our procedures are before going in the space. Look at this light, <laughs> you know. Um, do you have any other things, Giovanni, that you would add for that scenario? <laughs> well, my, I, I will say that um, many people maybe put focus on the, the last part, right? When Dan say, well, you know what, you are overreacting. And that's immediately say, oh my God, the director is saying that. So you say, here is an, a lack of safety culture or safety policy or commitment from the top uh, with the policies regarding safety. So, well, we, we can think that that's the important part, but uh, as uh, Riva mentioned, it's an uh, at all of many failures on the tips that we mentioned during the session that the management and the leadership should have it for a successful management. Yes, Mark. One thing that I think helps is it said the the scenario was um, new hire Nancy, <laughs> whatever her name was, uh, went to the director and expressed concern. You can often get, when it comes to safety stuff, you can often get a lot more traction if that's in writing. Because then your director, it's, if it's a verbal thing, he says, oh, you're overreacting. That's one thing. But if you have something in writing, and even an email that says, hey, I observed this. This was uncomfortable to me. I think there's some issues. Is there a policy in place that you can direct me to that that talks about the lab safety and how we handle these things. Mm -hmm. And that tends to maybe more gently but firmly um, escalate it and can get a result. I don't like the idea of just saying, well, this is not a place I want to work and leave. Um, and, but maybe that's where you end up. And then the other thing is, if you're really getting no satisfaction there, then things like OSHA can be, you know, you can contact OSHA and say, even anonymously, right? And, and again, I'm not an advocate of that necessarily, but you can make an incident report and say, hey, look, I think things are going on unsafe in this laboratory and it, they're not getting fixed. So that's just a couple of thoughts. Yeah, no, great. That's, that's actually something that we talk about clear procedures and policies. Part of that is to have an, a, a process, a terminate process for escalate this type of situation in, a, in a, not only in a verbal way, but in the right way, form properly, uh, th that could be tracking, you know, that have an uh, external uh, parties that can uh, follow that and tracking that and, and be sure that is uh, uh, accomplished and, and, and apply it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Yeah. And on, again, when, when we're on the leadership thing, I mean, you know, when you hear high power lasers and you hear x-rays, I mean, sometimes that usually gives people a little bit of heebie-jeebies. So like, you know, as a leader, again, that's the importance of just knowing what's going on in your area. And, you know, that sometimes with, um, you know, complex 
equipment and um, programs, you know, it may be making sure that, you know, hey, we may not necessarily have the internal expertise to make sure that we're doing this correctly. And it may be appropriate to bring in, you know, a third party even before something, you know, goes wrong. So Mm -hmm. it's just another thing to be aware of. We have another uh, (laughs) case (laughs) of study um, about the leadership Larry Again, it's an, uh, no, it's not a real person, it's just a fictitious name. He's really excited for the total solar eclipse in April. He has just uh, received a grant to take a new telescope with the new technology out the field to observe. Larry also want to regard, reward two teammates, Marcel and David, for their great work this past year. At the site, Marcel has to climb a ladder about halfway up their foot slips and they fall roughly four feet, landing on their back. Larry and David rush over to see if they are okay. Marcel says they are not hurt, even though David noticed they are holding their back and rubbing their heat. Marcel insists they are fine and they get back to work. Larry is very upset uh, by what happened and believe is, uh, it was Marcel's fault, although their heat feels better after a few hours. Marcel cannot walk for more than 10 minutes without severe pain in their back. They tell Larry they can no longer assist with setting up the scope on the hill, which is essential to this project. So, very, <laughs> or, or samples are very extreme, sorry. <laughs> Any uh, ideas or thought about the situation? Uh, This is actually a really great scenario because we do a lot of field work and sprained ankles and smaller injuries like that uh, happen quite, I don't say they happen quite often, but it's the number one injury that could happen. And something like this, somebody hurts their ankle, doesn't say anything, they want to get back to work, they want to keep doing the science. Um, It is a serious issue. So if I was in this scenario and let's say I'm David, who... Didn't, wasn't on the ladder or wasn't, wasn't Larry just observing. Uh, there's some clear issues with Larry placing blame instead of looking for ways to make, make things safer. Was there ladder training as part of this, uh, training to even go into the field, uh, training with the telescope? So there's a lot of training issues here. There's a lot of um, emotions and placing blame that need to be dealt with. Clearly, Marcel also needs to understand that as their role, they have to know their limits, understand if they were hurt, they need to get help. Um, And so it just seems like it's a a global, I don't know, culture of safety issue um, at play. But those those critical conversations need to happen. So even if, like in our facility, especially if if somebody sees something or um, if somebody does get injured, they need to be comfortable going to leadership and letting them know and if leadership is if if they believe that the leadership's answer isn't appropriate they need to be comfortable to to speak up also and i think that's a really important uh, cultural consideration in the safety workplace thank you well i think um i think we're almost that was a great uh it's <laughs> a great insight there so oh you got one well, we are out of time. I'm no, sorry. No, 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 no. We have two minutes. <laughs> That's not our fault that you don't put on the group. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But we can take just one. Question. Yeah, because I mean, we're going into a break. So last one. Okay, one of the things that worries me when I'm managing a facility and looking at safety is human error and how the institution handles that. You have someone who's well-trained, done the job all the time, and they're off their, their game one day, not noticeably, but they forget to unplug the rack before they start installing equipment and there's a mm-hmm. spark. Okay. This is, you know, the institutions tend to punish people in the reviews and other things. Are there better ways to handle that kind of thing where people just make mistakes? Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Um, you know, I think when it comes to human error, I mean, that that is part of, you know, the leadership is, you know, having that training and communication out there of like, you know, it's okay to make mistakes. Um, here's the way that we 
may do an investigation to address mistakes, but it's also, you know, looking into that whole human factors as a whole. So like, you know, at our facility now, we've actually integrated a human factors engineer to try to even take a lot of those, um, you know, to try to think about what the mistakes are before that they can happen. You know, it also comes into just having programs in place before that, like, you know, just fit for duty assessments or fatigue assessments, yeah. you know, again, the clear procedures and checklists. And, you know, sometimes I don't I, I mean, sometimes it just comes down to that attitude of like, you know, there's not really a mistake that we can't fix. But again, that that needs to come from the leadership level. And, you know, I mean, I, mean, I think if there's times of like blatant negligence or, you know, but it is having that like clearly written in like roles and responsibilities and clear policies and procedures yeah. and, you know, trying to eliminate these snag points before they happen. Mm. And I guess complacency, I think, is a, is accounted for, I think, like over 50 percent of workplace yeah. injuries. But, but, but through a strong assessment of your management system on safety, you will find those issues from time to time and add to your program, creating new and uh, improvement ways and tools to avoid it. So I think it's very important that point too. I think we have run, oh, zero, run over time. <laughs> Thank you very much to everyone. We uh, appreciate uh, your participation. Thank you, Riva.